Good morning and welcome to Eureka Springs United Methodist Church. Today we're asking the question, what makes a Christian a Christian? And if you Google that, you probably only get really one answer. It's the dogmatic one. And it really has nothing to do with what Jesus ever said or did. So we're going to unpack those layers and examine what does Jesus ask of us when we say that we're a Christian? So thank you for joining us. We hope that our music, our prayers, and our worship bring you much comfort and joy. As we gather, may your spirit work within us. As we gather, may we glorify your name. Knowing well that as our hearts begin to worship, We'll be blessed because we came. As we gather, may your spirit work within us. As we gather, may we glorify your name. Knowing well that as our hearts begin to worship, we'll be blessed because we came. Let us pray together. Holy Father, we thank you for this day. How blessed we are to have this church home, the place where we are touched by the presence of you, your Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yes, we know you are always with us wherever we go, but here in this sanctuary, we are in your sacred home. Here also, we are so privileged to have a pastor who so willingly provides us with spiritual guidance and leadership. The outside world is sometimes more than we mere mortals can comprehend. A pandemic with seemingly no end, the threat of a pending war halfway around the globe. But it touches us here. Rampant homelessness and hunger anxiety and illness and death. No one is totally free of care and concern. And yet, God, we truly want to do as you ask us as your children. Help us to turn all our worries and wishes over to you and lead us in being more like the Samaritan that came to the aid of a stranger and went into action just as Jesus did time after time. That is the kind of miracle we are capable of doing if we only listen to you. With humble hearts, we kneel at the foot of the cross on which Jesus Christ died to save us. We offer the prayer that our Savior taught his disciples. Please join me. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Good morning. Glad you're all here this morning. So we're doing a few new songs almost every week that you all maybe or maybe not have sung. And I was thinking this morning about John Wesley. Uh, none of you all were around, I hope not, uh, back in 1761. But in 1761, John Wesley wrote a set of rules for singing hymns. And he also uh, uh, helped to write a lot of hymns. But for years, these things, I don't know if they're in the current hymn or not, but for years, these, these rules were posted, and I'm not going to read them all. But he said, sing, sing all. All of you sing. Uh, sing loudly. Sing lustily. Sing modestly. He says in one of them, sing loud, but don't sing to the point that you're heard over other people, meaning sing together. He's having fun with it. I'll guarantee you when he wrote those in the 1700s, None of these songs were written, and almost none of the songs in the hymnal were written. They all became contemporary at some point later on in life. But the point was, he knew the importance of worship and of worship through music. So as I, as I uh, start these new songs, uh, you probably pick up that I, I do them often enough through them that, that you pick up on what they are. So I invite you each week, uh, whether you're just worshiping in prayer or worshiping silently and listening to the words, or singing out, stand up and let's worship God and, and take this time each week and make it a great time. So let's stand together, great and mighty. Is the Lord our God great and mighty is He? Great and mighty is the Lord our God great and mighty is He. Well, lift up the banners, let the anthems ring praises to our King. Great and mighty is the Lord our God great and mighty is He. Well, great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. Well, lift up your banners, let the anthems ring. Praises to our King. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. Mighty is our God. Mighty is our King, mighty is our Lord, ruler of everything. Glory to our God, glory to our King, glory to our Lord, ruler of everything. His name is higher, higher than any other name. His power is greater, for He has created everything. Mighty is our God, mighty is our King, mighty is our Lord, ruler of everything. Glory to our God, glory to our King. Glory to our Lord, ruler of everything. You'll know this one. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength, let every breath, all that I am, seem to worship you. Shout to the Lord of the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty praises the King. Mountains bow down 
sun and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. Well, I sing for joy at the work of your hands. Forever I love you, forever I stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. earth let us see the power and majesty praise to the king mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name well, I sing for joy at the work of your hands forever I'll serve you forever I'll stand is to the promise I have in you. Shout to the Lord, let the earth let us see. Power and majesty, praise to the King. The mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound. promise I have to you. Well, nothing compares to the promise I have in you. You may be seated. The scripture reading today, which is quoted from the New International Version Bible, comes from the book of Luke, chapter 10, verses 25 through 37, a chapter you're very familiar with, the parable of the Good Samaritan. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied, how do you read it? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, and he took him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took out two silver Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense that you have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Thanks be to God for the gift of the scriptures. Thanks be to God.
Well, may we pray. God, as we open these scriptures, may your spirit guide us as we seek understanding and guidance. Help us to see with the eyes of love, with the eyes of Christ, the way in which we're called to walk. Bless us and keep us as we study the word that you've given us. Amen. Well, we're starting out with the question this time, with what makes a Christian a Christian? And there's been a whole ton of theology that's been glossed over this question. You know, what does make a Christian a Christian? And you know, down through the ages, we've started wars over this. I mean, the Catholics and the Orthodox still fight over whether or not does the Holy Spirit come from the Father or from the Father and the Son. And depending on how you answer that, you might not be a Christian. You know, in our Protestant world, it's how you're baptized. I was told, because I was sprinkled, I'm not really a Christian. Because you have to be taken down to the river and fully dumped. Or it just doesn't count. Now, as a Methodist, I am more than happy to take any of you down to the river and immerse you. Anytime you want. I get a thrill out of that. But... In the Methodist Church, we don't think it's the water that saves you. It's God's love. So the water's just a symbol. But, but that's been an answer. A Christian means you've been fully immersed into the water. If you haven't been, if you've been sprinkled or poured, it just doesn't count. And if you happen to have been a baby when it was done, well, that doesn't count either. You have to be an adult believer. All sorts of answers to this question, what makes a Christian a Christian? You have to belong to the right denomination. You know, don't belong to that one down the street. They're heretics. I've even been told you have to belong to the right church. Not denomination, but the right church. I was talking to a little country pastor, and he said, no, no, the only way you can be a Christian is if you're a member of my church. Really? So 8 billion people are going to hell because they've never been introduced to your little church in Podunk, Arkansas. Yep, that's right. What makes a Christian a Christian? We argue over it. We fight over it. We all have our different answers. I mean, you Google it, and uh, amazingly, when you Google anything, you come up with 10 million different answers that are unhelpful. But when you Google this question, uh, it comes up with the same answer. And you've probably heard it before. It's, it's the little... Uh, how to lead someone to Christ, you know, in four simple steps. First is, you got to believe that Jesus died and was raised for you. Second, you have to repent of your sins and confess them. And third, you have to say this cute little prayer. It's called the sinner's prayer. I think Billy Graham came up with it. And it's used all over the place. And it goes something like this. God, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. I accept Jesus into my heart. Blah, blah, blah. Bam! You're good to go. You're a Christian. If you haven't done all that, you're obviously not a Christian. I was asked once, did you ever pray that prayer that Reverend Graham gave us? And I was young and I was naive and I'd never heard of it. No. Well, you're not a Christian. You're just a Methodist. Okay. I didn't know any better. Nobody told me that. In today's world, Christianity has been boiled down to nothing but that. And I think that answer is extremely lacking. I think you'd be hard-pressed to go throughout the Bible and find anywhere where Jesus said, if you want to be saved, let me into your heart. Or accept me as your Lord and Savior. I don't think Jesus ever said those words. And that's probably shocking to many of us who have grown up in the South and we've heard that our whole life. That if you're a real Christian, you have to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Now, is there anything wrong with that? No, I don't think so. Except for the fact that it's created a whole bunch of Christians that when you look at their life, their words and their actions, you're left scratching their, your head wondering, is that what it means to be a Christian? You're the most hateful, judgmental, bitter person I've ever come across in my life. You have no compassion for anybody, and yet because 
you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're going to heaven and I'm not? Did you know Adolf Hitler was a baptized Christian? Does he get to go? Because he went through the ritual and somebody else like a Mahatma Gandhi, who is probably one of the greatest non-saints in the world, he doesn't get to go because he was a Hindu? I got a problem with that. Now you start opening your Bible and you start, you know, you peel away all the denominational nonsense and all the theologies. You know, theologians will have an answer for everything. And they all, they're kind of like economists and they'll all disagree over the answer. And our, we've grown up in a church and in a Christian environment where theology after theology has been laid over the words of Jesus And sometimes we just need to go back to the Gospels and just encounter Jesus the way the first Christians did. How the first Christians would have heard Jesus. And we're going to do that today about this question, what makes a Christian a Christian? There's two places in Luke's Gospel where that question comes up. Both are from a, a legal expert, a lawyer or a scribe that come to Jesus to test Him. You know how religious folk are. They love to test your knowledge of the Bible. Are you really a Christian? Let me quiz you. What does Psalm 139.7 say? You know, something like that. They come to Jesus and they ask Him, Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Later on in Luke's Gospel, there will be another one. Jesus, what must I do to have everlasting life? It's the same question. What Jesus... What must I do to be saved? What must I do to be your follower? It's the same questions. And of course, if you've read the Gospels, and I, wonder, I sometimes wonder if Christians have ever bothered to read the Gospels, especially when I see how they behave or what they believe in. If you've done that, you notice that Jesus is very frustrating because He never gives you the black and white answer. He always wants to tell you a story. And he responds to this guy with a story. Well, let me answer you. And he starts out. And we've all heard the story. It's the story of the Good Samaritan. Nowhere in the story does it say he's the Good Samaritan. That was added much later. Uh, But when you read the story, let's hear it the way the first century people would have heard it. First of all, let's set the scene. They're on this road from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, it's a famous road in antiquity. It's kind of the shortcut. It's about six miles long, but it goes from a height of uh, 3,200 meters down to sea level. So it's very steep, very crooked, kind of like the roads around the Ozark Mountains. Highway 23, you know, you don't want to be out there at night or behind somebody from Kansas. It's going to be difficult. They're on this road, and it's a very rough and rugged road, and not everybody takes it because in the ancient world, this road, though it was a shortcut, this was the road where the bandits hid out. Bandits and robbers, because they knew whatever person they robbed on this road, they could get away with it because it's so steep and rugged and nobody was out there. And so it was just plagued with bandits. So when you read it, you've got to ask yourself, why are these people on this road? First person we're introduced to is the priest, the reverend, the preacher. What's he doing out there? Well, he's probably on his way to Jerusalem. You know, the priest in that time, they... They had, a, they had to pull watch. They had different duties in the temple. And it was his time. And since he's on this road, he's probably taken the shortcut. He's probably a little late. You know, for years we've interpreted this story as these are bad people. You know, the, the priest and the Levite. Because they're just not, they don't have much empathy. But that's, that's a bad reading. They have great excuses for what they do. The priest is late, he's got to go to the temple, and he comes across what looks like a dead body. And in the Old Testament, if you touch a dead body, you're now unclean. 
And if he's unclean, he can't go to the temple and serve his time, his duty. And he's late anyway. And besides, if you were on a dark desert highway at night and there was a dead body, would you stop? What, what could that be? I mean, I'll tell you in Iraq, if we came across something like that, the first thing we're thinking of, it's a bomb. This is a trap. We stop, we're going to get shot. So maybe he's thinking that too. Maybe this is a way for me to turn my back and somebody else hits me in the back of the head. Or maybe it's because I'm late. Maybe it's because I do think it's a dead body and i got to go to the temple and serve my time with God. So he goes on by. Don't condemn him. He has good reasons. Next up is a Levite. He's one of those laity, you know, church people. He's going to the temple too to serve his time. Same excuses apply. Is this a trick? Is this a trap? I'm late. If I touch him and he's, he's dead, I can't go to the temple. And, and they need me there. They, they pass on by. They leave this body there. And then a Samaritan comes. Now, we're so far removed from this, it's hard for us to understand. Jews and Samaritans hated each other. The Samaritans were the people that stayed after the exile and intermarried with the different pagans and Greeks and all the others. Uh, They were considered half-breeds. They didn't really believe in the Jewish faith because of the intermarriage and because they worshipped on another mountain. I mean, they hated one another. It was a religious feud. And there's also something else. Samaria is about as far away from this road as Texas is from us. And you know what we do when we see a Texan on a road somewhere? What are they doing out here? Ain't from around here, are you? What's he doing here? What's he doing here so far from home? Anybody want to take a guess? I just told you earlier. What's this road full of? Bandits, robbers, and thugs. And as a good Jew, that's what those Samaritans are anyway. A bunch of thugs and bandits. And what's he doing so far away from Samaria? Well, he's down here beating up us Jews and robbing from us. That's how the first century... Jewish listeners of Jesus' day would have heard this. Uh Uh-huh, I know what he's doing. And then Jesus throws in the humdinger, and the Samaritan stopped, went over to the body, turned him over, dressed his wounds, gave him something to eat, something to drink, put him on his donkey, led him into town, checked into a motel, told the motel owner, Here's a couple of days' wages. That's what a Daenerys is. You take care of this guy for me. And I'll be back. And whatever bill, whatever room tab he's run up, I'll pay it. Just take care of him. He needs somebody to look after him. And Jesus finishes that story and he looks at the scribe, lawyer, you know, the religious know-it-all who was asking the question in the first place, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to have eternal life? And he says, do you get it now? Who of these three was the neighbor to that man lying there in the ditch? And that Jewish, that religious lawyer who hates Samaritans so much, he can't even say it. He simply says, well, I guess it was the man who showed compassion to the guy lying in the ditch. And that's how Jesus answers the question. What makes a Christian a Christian? How do we inherit eternal life? How are we saved? We can say we've accepted Jesus in our heart all we want, but if we're the type of Christian that walks on by when we see somebody in need. Somebody who's broken, who's hurt, who's hungry, who's naked, who's thirsty. If we walk on by, we have no right 
to say we are saved or we are Christians. Because that's what Jesus says. Now I imagine His disciples were thinking, "Uh uh-oh, this is not going to be quite as easy as we thought. This faith thing requires something of me. I think one of the biggest uh, mistakes in the Protestant faith that we've made is we divorced works from faith. Martin Luther never said that. He said, yeah, your salvation doesn't depend on what you do. It's something God gives you. But what you do is definitely a criteria of whether or not you actually have faith. I think in the Christian church today, we've got too many people, too many Christians who do not apply the works to their faith. They think that God is asking nothing of them. Hey, I'm I'm saved. I'm good to go. I can go be the reprobate I am as much as I want because I I was baptized. Or hey, I believe that the the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. Or I I said that sinner's prayer. I'm, I'm good to go. And Jesus says, no. Your faith should compel you. Should fill you with compassion and love that you would never walk on by someone in need. We got in the Christian faith in America something what Dietrich Bonhoeffer called cheap grace. It's something that impacted Nazi Germany. He was a famous Protestant theologian and he looked around Germany and he asked the question, how can all of you claim to be Christians when you're watching the Jews and others be rounded up and exterminated? How can you claim that you're saved? Because... Faith to you is nothing but cheap grace. And he condemned his fellow Christians in Germany because they turned the blind eye to those who were suffering, to those who were broken, to those who were in need because they thought, no, I'm a member of a church. I've been baptized. I believe what the creed says. I've done everything I've given my money. Aren't I good? And Jesus says, no, you're not. Quit pretending. Because faith should fill you with so much love and compassion, you'd never pass by someone in need. What makes a Christian a Christian? It's not what we've grown up believing. I don't think God cares how you were baptized. I don't think God cares whether or not you believe everything in the Nicene Creed. I don't think God cares that you got down on your knees and you prayed the sinner's prayer if you go out there in the real world and you don't care about your neighbor. For Jesus, that's what faith implies. The love that we have for one another. It's funny that the lawyer at the beginning uh, asked, well, Jesus, just who is my neighbor? I know I'm supposed to love God and love my neighbor, but who is my neighbor? And Jesus said, everybody you run across who is in need, who is broken, who is empty, who is crying out, who is reaching out their hands saying, help me. And you know, if we actually took that seriously, my gosh, would the church be a powerful institution. If every day we went out into the world and we made a conscious effort not to pass by someone in need, to say the right things, I mean, it doesn't take much. Every day we meet people battling horrible things. And all it takes is just a pause and How are you? You know God loves you. We love you too. We get so wrapped up in ourselves, we we go by people and we don't see them. And they're hurting. And they're yearning. And they're asking for help. 
And we don't hear them. Because like the priest and the Levite, we're just so busy. And we got all these other excuses. One of the most heartbreaking things during this pandemic, you know, we started a food ministry at this church to feed everybody. And I, I feel so ashamed of how blind I am to the suffering right here in Carroll County, right here in Eureka Springs. I had no idea people were going without food every other day. I'd heard about that, but it wasn't real to me. I didn't know people lived in tents and in the back of their cars. I'd heard that. I'd never seen it. It's all around us. People laying on the roadsides, waiting for someone to stop and say, here, let me help you. We encounter these people every day of our lives. They might be addicts and alcoholics. They might be suffering from mental diseases. They might be poor and starving. They might have just suffered through a divorce or the loss of a spouse, loss of a job. They're wanting someone to notice them, that they're hurt, that they need love. They're waiting for us. And if we're going to say that we've accepted Jesus into our heart, And if we're going to say that we're Christians, then we have to open our eyes and see them. You will encounter these people hundreds of times a day. And we could get so wrapped up in our own problems that we could just huff and puff and walk on by, or we can actually look at them and say, I see you, and offer them something. What makes a Christian a Christian? It's pretty simple. It's the love and compassion that we're willing to hold for all the people in this world. Famous Catholic theologian Karl Rahner coined this term, the anonymous Christian, because he was bothered by the fact that many churches said, well, somebody like Mahatma Gandhi, who's a Hindu, couldn't possibly be saved. And Rahner said, no, I can't believe that. I can't believe that a bunch of Nazi Christians in Germany are saved, and he couldn't be. And he emphasized the theology that if we're saved, then by gosh, our love and our actions better show it. Otherwise, it's just a bunch of empty words, meaningless to God and to everyone else. May we pray. God, we seek to live as Your people and as Christ followers. We open the Gospels to read about Jesus and in every way He loved the least, the last, and the lost. He stopped and to heal the broken and the wounded. He stopped to accept and to love those who had been rejected. He included with His disciples the tax collectors, the sinners, the prostitutes, the simple fishermen. To all these and more, He said, I don't care what the world says about you. I see you and I embrace you. He challenged His followers. He said, if you truly wish to inherit the kingdom of God, then what you do to the least of these, you do to me. You love them, you keep them, you serve them, you heal them. You do all in your power to alleviate their suffering. For that's what it means to live with me in your heart. This we pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us remember our baptism this morning. That moment when we came to the font and we gave our life to Christ and we promised to love and to serve Him. Those aren't just empty words. It was a challenge to go out into mission, to see the people who are broken, 
to see the people who are in need and to love them with all of our heart and soul and mind and to bind up their wounds and to include them. God poured out His love upon us while we were yet sinners. And He calls us to pour out our love upon all those the world has judged to be nobodies. For in God's eyes, they are everything. And we should see everybody we meet as a precious child of God's making. Amen. In a few moments, we will gather to celebrate Holy Communion. These gifts of bread and wine, they don't belong to our church or to any church. They belong to God. And God gave Christ to the world so that everyone could be saved. Everyone here is welcome at this table, regardless of your church membership, regardless of your sins. You are welcome. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, He took a loaf of bread. He gave thanks to His Father in heaven. And breaking the bread, He gave it to His followers with these words. Take and eat. This is My body that I break for you. Do this in remembrance of Me so that you will know how to live as well. Jesus' followers thought about everything that He had said and everything that He had done with them. They thought about His love, His compassion that He showed to the least, the last, and the lost. How He healed the sick. How He embraced the outcast. How He included everyone. And as they thought about the power of that love, Jesus would end the supper by pouring a cup of the wine. And He would bless it. And He would give it to each of them with these words. Take and drink, for this is the cup of life that I pour out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this also in remembrance of me. May we pray. Father, we who are many gather at this table and together we pray that You would pour out Your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, His life, His Spirit, and His grace. That we may eat of the bread of heaven and drink from the cup of life to live as Your people to live as your followers. For we are called to be the hands and the feet of Christ, to do and to say all that He said and did. God, we pray for the strength and the courage to be the believers that You've called us to be. Help us to look past our dogmas and our doctrines, our creeds, and all those other things that we disagree over Help us to see that truly it is love that saves us. The love that you hold for us, the love that we hold for you and for our neighbor. For this is the love that Christ came in the world to give. And so God, we come to this table to claim this gift of love, to make this new beginning that we can be the church that You've always called us to be. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Janet. Janet, the body of Christ, broken in you. Go.